Hey everyone, I'm Kerlunkus, and welcome to Haunted Gaming Revisited. Now, this might seem a little bit weird to everyone, but I took it upon myself to try and bring back the spirit of Haunted Gaming, like the original Haunted Gaming that some ordinary gamers did back in the day, you know, all that stuff. Basically, I'm just going to follow the same format, and with that out of the way, I'm going to start with this creepypasta, Metroid 2 Secret Worlds. A few months ago, I was busy preparing to move to a new house when I came across something from my past. I was going through my belongings, trying to figure out what to keep and what to discard, when I found an old shoebox stuffed down the back of my closet. Curious, I opened it up and found that it was full of CDs. I flipped through them and realized that these were backups of files from over 10 years ago. I remember that this was how I used to back up stuff before external hard drives became affordable enough for me to just start backing up with them. I stopped packing and started checking out the CDs on my computer. They were mostly full of stuff I'd collected off the net like MP3s, ROMs, and animated GIFs. I then came across a CD that was labeled Conversations with Pawn. I stared at the CD with some reservation for a moment before loading it into my computer. The CD contained a bunch of images, a couple of audio files, and some text dumps from a message board. Looking over these files made me recall an incident that had occurred many years ago. It was an incident that had slipped from my mind until I saw that CD again. Honestly, I was glad to have forgotten about it. It was a pretty freaky experience and to this day, I still don't know what to make of it. It was 2004, I was in my last year at high school and I spent most of my free time being an admin for an emulation message board. It wasn't a particularly taxing job. I was one of the three guys who were admins and the board itself was pretty niche so we usually didn't get a great deal of traffic. Back then, there wasn't the bot problems you find on boards these days. Most of the time, I just had to log in, check my messages, then browse through the forums to see if anyone was breaking any rules or just being a dick. It was a pretty fun gig. I got the most enjoyment out of messing with persistent trolls. Being an admin allowed me to change their avatars, and I had pictures of crying babies for such occasions, or to edit their posts. Usually, I'd have them say stuff like, I suck. I cry to my pillow at night, or my personal favorite, I left my brain in the womb. Basically I used to get a real kick out of administrating justice out of the board. So one night, a new guy registered to the forum and created a thread called Need Help to Pull Apart My NES. The following is from that thread. Hi guys, I'm just wondering if anyone has any links to diagrams for an NES. I've been hunting around the internet for a while and I'm having a hard time finding them. I've got an old NES that I want to pull apart and modify. There's a few resources you can look at here. The site's a bit of a jumbled mess, but it should be a good place to start. Good luck. You can also check out this site. They have a message board you can join up with to ask for advice. Thanks guys. Jeez, these diagrams and instructions look really complicated. Man, I hope I can get this to work. I was slightly mystified by his question, and I had some time to kill, so I thought I'd ask him. Hey Pawn, I'm just curious, what kind of modification are you looking to do to your NES? Hi Pismerga. As a kid, I used to play the hell out of NES games, but my NES broke down a few years back. I got a Game Boy, and I want to rip the card reader out of my NES to attach it to my Game Boy. I guess since the Game Boy and NES graphics look about the same, that should work? No, oh, wow, that sounds like a really bad idea. You'll probably just end up wrecking both systems. If you want to play some NES games, why don't you just get an emulator? Hi Pismerga. Yeah, I thought about that. While I was trying to find diagrams for the NES, I kept finding emulation web pages. That's how I stumbled across the site. I can't afford those card readers that you buy that let you hook up cartridges to PCs though. My next plan would be to make a card reader myself for my NES that I can hook up to my PC. Um, that's not necessary. You can just download ROMs and you'll be good to go. Don't ask where to get ROMs though, it's against the forum rules. Hi Pismurgo, what, what are ROMs? I almost laughed at this. I explained to Pawn what ROMs were, and he got really excited. Hi, Pismurga. Oh my god, are you telling me I can play NES games on my PC right now? I got the gist that he really wasn't technically savvy. Which was fair enough. We all had to start from somewhere. After explaining to him about ROMs and emulators, I didn't hear back from him for a few days. He then came back to the board and became a bit of a regular. He would mostly start threads in which he was asking questions about emulation problems he was having. A lot of people didn't have any time for him. They felt that he was just an annoying person who asked dumb questions. 
I remember one night he had started a thread about how he couldn't get an emulator to read games he downloaded. We then had to explain to him what a zip file was and how it worked. One of the other admins was thinking of just banning him. He didn't like the fact that Pawn was starting up new threads about stuff that had already been answered in earlier threads. I told him not to do that and I'd have a word with Pawn. I don't know why I decided to step in, I sort of felt bad for the kid I guess. I also felt a bit of a connection to him because he was one of the few people I'd run across who was, who was also a fan of the RPG Suikoden. So I told Pond to check through the board before posting any questions that might have already been asked and answered. I then told him if he really got stuck, to just private message me. It wasn't long before he started messaging me. At first, he would just ask me questions. Lots of questions. Fortunately, he seemed to be a quick study. I didn't find myself having to explain things to him over and over again, so I wouldn't say he was stupid, just green. Soon enough, he asked me for some game recommendations, and this led to us talking about what games we were playing. It was from there that we started having a correspondence over the next few months. We only really talked about games and movies, though. The only personal stuff that I knew about him was that he was 16 and he lived in London. One night, we were having a conversation about Metroid games. I just clocked Super Metroid for the millionth time and was thinking about dusting off the original Metroid and giving that a go. Hey, that reminds me, have you ever heard of the secret worlds in Metroid 2? It was a pretty well known glitch. Basically how it works is, if you're falling down a long shaft in some places in the game and then press the select button repeatedly really fast, you can make wall tiles disappear. If you go through the tunnel that's created, you'll end up outside the map. You can then find rooms that are tile swaps of regular rooms, rooms that scroll repeatedly forever, and rooms that look like they've been randomly thrown together. Apart from using it to sequence break, it's pretty pointless. It's more of a novelty than anything else. Some people started up a website devoted to the secret worlds. They were obsessed with mapping the whole thing out, like they were explorers braving uncharted territory or something. I tried it out myself once on my Game Boy. I quickly got frustrated though after I kept getting stuck in walls when I moved between rooms. Oh yeah, I remember that glitch. Why do you ask? I just found out about it, and I finally got it to work today. It's kind of fun. I didn't hear from Pod for a couple days after that. Then one night, he sent me a message. Hey, I'm still messing around with the Metroid 2 Secret World. I've been reading up on how to use the Secret Worlds to skip areas of the game. I'm still getting the hang of it, but it's really trippy in here. That's hard to describe. I taught Pond how to take snapshots and upload them so that he could show me the stuff he was finding. A few days later, I got a message. Hi, Pesmurga. God, you're not gonna believe it. The game just scared the crap out of me. I was messing around in this secret world and all of a sudden I went into a room. The music changed and started playing like I had to fight a Metroid. The next thing I know, this garbled mess is flying at me. Absolutely freaked the hell out of me. Well, at least you can see now I figured out how to take screenshots. I'll let you know if I see anything else. I'm loving this hidden world stuff. Pawn. Oh yeah, I forgot that you can run into glitched out monsters in the secret world. Don't worry too much about them, man. Like, the rooms, they're all just graphically messed up, but they'll still behave the same way they do in the game. After that, I didn't hear from him for about a week. Then one night, I was on the message board and got the following message. Pesmurga, something weird is going on. I found a new area tonight. It's a room which is made up of bits and pieces of save points. I found a room like this before, but this one's different. None of the saves work, which is weird because they usually do in the secret world. And usually, when you stand on saves in the secret world, there are weird symbols where it should say, press start to save. But some of these saves are different. When I stand on them, random words appear. I'm uploading the photos now, I'll send you the links in a moment. Pond sent me the links and I looked over the images he had uploaded. Dare. Legacy. My. Stop. You. Stealing. How. I knew straight away that this wasn't a glitch. Look man, I've never heard anyone mention anything like what you're describing. To me, it sounds like that ROM image has been hacked. I asked him where he got the ROM from and he gave me the address, but when I checked it out, the page wasn't there anymore. Which wasn't really surprising. Back then, ROM websites were frequently popping up and being taken down almost immediately. Is there any chance it could damage my computer? I wouldn't think so. I've never heard of a hacked ROM doing any malicious damage before. Just to be on the safe side though, you should make sure you have the latest antivirus software and do a scan. Okay, cool. I'm gonna keep playing around with it then. I'll let you know if I find any more surprises. Catch you later. Just before I was about to go to bed, I looked at the pictures again. It occurred to me that the words might form a sentence. 
I wrote the words down on a piece of paper and started trying out combinations. Eventually, I came up with, how dare you stop stealing my legacy. I thought it was a rather strange sentence. I couldn't figure out why anyone would even bother hacking that message into the game. I didn't even understand what it meant. A few days later, I got another message from Pawn. Pesmerga, check this out. I turned on Metroid 2 tonight, and after pressing start to load up my game, something happened. Usually it goes straight to the... Pesmerga, check this out. I turned on Metroid 2 tonight, and after pressing start to load up my game, something happened. Usually goes straight to where you last saved, but this time it just stayed on the title screen. The sound became really distorted and I thought that it had frozen. I was just about to reset the game when the screen changed and this message popped up. Last chance to stop. Then this weird sound started playing. I don't know, it's really hard to describe. Is there any way to record sound of a, out of an emulator? I want to try to capture it if it happens again so you can hear it. I wonder who did this hack. I keep thinking that there must be a reason. If they bother to put this much effort in, then there must be more stuff to find. I'm gonna keep exploring and see what else I find. I taught Pond how to capture the audio and gave him my email address. I told him to attach the phone. I taught Pond how to capture the audio and gave him my email address. I told him to attach the file there if he did manage to record any sounds from the game. I thought about what Pond had described to me, and I had to admit that I was pretty impressed by the hack. I also agreed with Pond's reasoning. If someone had bothered to put this much effort in, then it was likely that they had done more. It was just a matter of finding it. Though I was surprised that I had never heard of the hack before, I started browsing through ROM hack sites trying to find the one that Pond was playing. I didn't have any luck, so I asked around in a few IRC channels, but no one had seen anything like what I was describing. The following night, I was browsing the message board when I noticed I had a new private message. I saw that it was from Pawn and opened it up. Pesmerga, something extra freaky tonight happened in the secret world. I found myself in a room that looks like one of the rooms with the statues and an item, except all the blocks are wrong. I walked, in, I walked into the room and the music played that you hear right when you run into a Metroid, except there wasn't a Metroid in the room. I left the room back the way I came in and I was in a different spot to how it was before. It was a passageway that just scrolls on endlessly. But the music is wrong, it doesn't sound like anything in the game. I managed to capture the sound, I'm about to email you the file. Okay, I'm just downloading the file now. Hey man, do you wanna play some Mario 2 later? Sure, sounds like fun. Hang on a sec, someone's knocking on my door, I'll be back in a moment. The audio file finished downloading and I listened to it while I waited for Pond to come back. I didn't know what to make of it. I'd never heard a Game Boy make that kind of sound before. At first it just sounded to me like a foghorn, but then another sound started to play over the top of the foghorn noise. The other sounds, d the other sound did seem familiar to me somehow, but I couldn't quite place it. I found myself getting spooked, so I quickly closed the file. I got up and made myself a cup of coffee and a snack. By the time I got back to my computer, 15 minutes had passed. You still there, man? I waited a few more minutes, but I didn't get a response from Pond. I got worried for a moment, but then just figured either a friend or family member had come by and he was busy. I surfed the net for a bit, did some admin duties, then checked my messages again. Pond still hadn't come back. I was pretty tired by that point, so I shut down my computer and went to bed. I got up early the next day and checked to see if Pond 
hadn't left me a message. He still hadn't gotten back to me. I headed off for school and didn't get home till the evening. After I grabbed a bite to eat, I sat in front of the computer and checked my email and private messages. There was still nothing from Pond. I left a few more messages and waited for his response. Over the next few days, he still didn't get to me and I really started to freak out. I skipped school for a few days and stuck pretty close to my computer. One afternoon, after performing some minor admin duties, I re-listened to the sound that Pod had sent me. I still couldn't make out what it was, so I started playing around with it in sound recorder. I sped it up a few times and realized that the foghorn sound might be the music that plays right before you fight the Metroid Queen. As I continued to speed the sound file up, I realized what the other sound was. Someone was talking over the music. I had to speed the sound up over 10 times to get it to sound like it was playing at the right speed. Once I had done that, I tried to make out what the voice was saying. I had to listen carefully a few times before I got it. The first part was an introduction. Someone was saying, I am, and after that was presumably their name. I couldn't catch what it was though, it wasn't an English name. The second part of the sentence was clear enough though, knock knock, I'm here. Needless to say, I was quite unnerved at that point. I hit the internet again trying to find anything I could about the version of Metro 2 that Pod had been playing. I emailed people at the Secret Worlds websites, I posted messages on numerous emulation websites, and I spoke to people on various IRC channels. Most people thought I was joking, the rest thought I was crazy. It seemed no one knew what the hell I was talking about. Then one night, I got a private message. Look up Gunpei Yokoi. I was a bit startled. When I'd been going around asking questions about Metroid 2, I hadn't been using Pesmerg as my username, nor had I mentioned what message board I was from. I replied back to the message wanting to know who was messaging me and how they'd found me, but the user never got back to me. After that, I kept an eye on the logs of user activity to see if he came back to the site, but he never did. I then took the message's advice and looked up the name Gunpei Yokoi. It didn't take me long to find out who he was. It turns out that he was hugely influential at Nintendo. Some of the games he worked on included the original Donkey Kong, Mario Bros., Kid Icarus, Metroid, and Metroid 2. But what he's best known for is arguably his greatest creation, the Game Boy. It's often described as his legacy. I kept reading the article in fascination when I got to a section that was about his life after leaving Nintendo. Not long after he left Nintendo and started his own company, Gunpei Yokoi died in a car accident. I glanced at the date of his death and that gave me a shock. It was October the 4th, 1997, the same day that I got my last message from Pon. I listened to the sped up version of the audio Pon had sent me and that's when I knew that the first part of the message was I am Gunpei Yokoi. It was after this realization that I went through a period, which went on for about a year, in which I flat out refused to answer a door unless the person identified themselves. Over the next few months, I scoured the internet for any news stories concerning a missing teenager in London. There were several stories that would pop up, but the details were so vague that any one of them, or none of them, could have been pawned. There was one story that did catch my attention. It was about a missing teenager who had been last seen at home. His mother had left for work and she said that he had been on the computer in the lounge room. When she returned several hours later, the lounge room was completely empty, but the computer and other various electrical appliances were still on. At first, she thought that he might have been in another part of the house, but when she checked, she found that it was empty. She then tried to call his mobile phone, and that was when she discovered that his phone and wallet were by the computer. It was at this point that she called the police. They investigated and found no sign of disturbance in the house and nothing was missing, except for the teenager. He vanished without a trace. I looked for more information online, but couldn't find anything else. I contemplated getting in touch with the police in London, but one thing stopped me. There was no way I could think to word my story without sounding like a crazy person. Even, I could, even if I could figure out how to word it properly, and if this missing team did happen to be pawn, there was no information that I could give them that they wouldn't get off his computer anyways. And if it wasn't pawn, then I would just be wasting their time and possibly end up in some sort of legal trouble. The words, hindering a police investigation, popped into my mind. 
I went back through my conversations with Pon to see if there were any clues to his real identity that I hadn't noticed before, but there was nothing there that revealed anything that I didn't already know about him. It was then that I realized that I was just assumed that he was a he in the first place. But there was nothing in our conversations to dismiss the possibility that Pond had been a female. The possibility of Pond being female instantly made the task of finding Pond twice as hard. In the end, I had to give up. I just didn't know what I could possibly do. I took screenshots of all my conversations with Pond, copied the pics and sound files he had emailed me, and burned them onto a CD, just in case I ever needed them again. Not long after that, I finished high school and then started working. Within a month, I stopped being an admin. I still stuck around the board for a few more months, but by then, I had no longer had the free time to post with any regularity. Over the following years, I got busy with life and everything that happened with Pond drifted further and further from my mind. I decided to write this all down and put it online in hopes that after all these years, someone might know something about what happened to Pond or know the version of Metroid 2 that he found. As I said at the beginning, I honestly don't know what to make of this. Is there a copy of Metroid 2 floating around the internet that's haunted by the ghost of Gunpei Yokoi? And if you have the misfortune to stumble across it, does he come to your door angry that you've dared to defile his legacy? I try not to think about it too much. When it does not cross my mind though, I like to imagine that the whole thing was an elaborate hoax perpetuated by Pond. That he set the whole thing up months in advance. He created the images and the audio files. He came onto the message board pretending to be a technically inept teenager when really he was brilliant with a PC. He was user 12345. He was the one who told me to look up Gunpei Yokoi. I like to imagine that he's still out there somewhere, still laughing about the wonderful joke he pulled all those years ago. Sometimes, I can almost convince myself that it was just a hoax. I think that was how I was able to get sleep at night in the months after I lost contact with Pond. And I think that telling myself that it was all a hoax now is going to come in real handy on those restless nights in the days to come. So for the very first episode of Haunted Gaming Revisited, this is a very, very nice creepypasta to start with. Mainly because of the key elements like the story buildup, but how well everything was pictured and the visuals that kept the story going. Everything made sense, every well, kinda, and everything just kind of slipped into everything just kind of perfectly slipped into into place. It was nice to see this strange occurrence happen over over the course of a few days, according to our protagonist here. But it also begs the question: What else could have been done in the small amount of time that Pawn and Pesmerga had been talking to each other? I mean, there's so much that that these two could have known about each other, and yet all of a sudden, Pawn starts playing this weird copy of Metroid 2 and just fucking goes missing. There's no sudden explanation for any disappearance, and we're left wondering what's going to happen to Pawn or where he is now. In all actuality, Pawn is probably okay, and maybe according to Pesmerga, it pretty much just was a hoax, and he just gave him a little spook. In the end, all I have to ask is, what would you guys, what would you guys rate this? What would you change to make it better? All the stuff that happened back then, because I feel like bringing it back now. Kind of missed it to be honest. This is me, Krilunkus, and if you like what you saw, like, comment, and subscribe. I'm out.